I am a citizen of the border. Sometimes they call me a cultural broker. I was born and raised here in the Sonoran Desert. My last 20 years as an educator, as a natural history educator and ethnobotanist at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum have connected me deeply with the cultural roots of this region and all the traditions that are part of this region. The Sonoran Desert uh, can be a very extreme environment. It can be too cold, as you know, it can be too hot, too wet, and too dry. These extreme conditions make living in this desert very unique. But at the same time, the plants that we are familiar with are so unique as well. And this desert is actually one of the most biodiverse deserts in the world because of those conditions. So when I talk about biodiversity, I'm not just talking about plants and animals. I am also talking about people. We have archaeological evidence right here in the Tucson Valley that for at least 4,000 years, people have been cultivating this land. 4,000 years. It's easy to say, but it's not the same to be able to see it. When the first Europeans arrived here, they brought with them culture, they brought with them their language, and they brought with them their crops. So an interesting blend happened with the native people living in this valley already. So when I include people in this biodiversity process, it's very interesting because people have a lot to do with it. People can add or also can subtract biodiversity. And when the Europeans arrived here, they brought with them many of these crops. So I see it as an increase of biodiversity, particularly in our crops. And this is an example of the Tucson Valley. Imagine the people that were living here at that time, whether you include the Native Americans and the few settlers who started, they had enough resources to live on just on the resource found right here. They probably didn't import much of what they ate, of the resources they needed. Now, if we look at a photo of the early 1800s here in Tucson, we can still see that Tucson was very much a farming town. We call it sustainable. Probably they didn't import much of their products. They were producing them here. The Santa Cruz River Valley, the floodplain of the river, and the surrounding hills very likely provided everything they needed to survive. But it's not the same when we look at the cities now. When we look at the city of Tucson in the same spot, and we see across the West, and actually across the world, this demographic explosion that basically it's all around us has compromised many things. When we look at the Tucson Basin, for instance, one of the first things that is compromised is our water resources. The next thing is fertile land. As you saw in the previous photograph, all the place where the city is located right now would have been farming land, and it's no longer there. So all of a sudden, we have to now rely in no land to grow our crops. We are relying on highly engineered environments, highly controlled, greenhouses, hydroponic systems, artificial soils, in many cases, we are increasing the amount of pesticides, artificial fertilizers to grow our crops. And I feel that we're compromising other things. We're compromising flavor and quality. Now, we understand that quality means something different for a corporate agribusiness or a small-scale organic farmer or an individual citizen. I personally look at flavor. I like sweets, particularly natural sweets. One of the things that I started thinking about when looking at this explosion of 
almost artificial environments to grow on food. And this food happens to be, in some cases, uh, so well engineered that they look like supermodels. Perfectly shaped, perfect colors, perfect size. Sometimes the flavor is not there, though, or the texture. So I started looking at my own background, looking at my family, looking at the place where I come from, and try to find some of those answers, looking at the way things used to be, the way my parents or my grandparents, all the people who first settled this region, including, of course, the Native Americans, and learn from their knowledge. Uh, sometimes we, uh, I, I'm gonna borrow something that I heard recently. Uh, people said, well, this is, this is a new approach to, to go back to organic and um, uh, local produced foods, uh, something new. And I heard it's, it's, not, it's not just new, it's new with a silent K. Because these people knew what they were doing. And we're just trying to bring that back. If we look at the Native American agriculture, from Tierra del Fuego all the way to Alaska, we can find that many native plants were being cultivated in great quantities to provide our food and the supplies that people needed. There are places now in Mexico, in South America, in Peru, where people continue to plant and harvest these traditional crops that are native to the Americas. And we're lucky that we still have them here, but we continue to ignore them. So it takes a little bit of extra effort to go back and see that many people continue to use these crops that haven't been here for hundreds of years. Some of them have been here for thousands of years. One of these is one example, agaves, and we all know because of the spirits that we get to taste out of these plants. This is a plant that is very popular throughout the world, and at least it gives us a little chance to Take a look at the past and see where this plant comes from and the things that we can get out of it. It's not just tequila, it's just not mezcal. There's food, there's pulque, there's fermented drinks. There's biodiversity that goes along because there are many, many kinds of agaves. And the same thing can be said for prickly pear and legumes that we have all around. So when the Europeans brought their crops and brought their culture, brought their, their foods, uh, an interesting blend happened. So here I now see an increase of biodiversity because they brought foods that now we see in the supermarket all the time and we feel familiar with them, but these are foods that came here and increased the amount of biodiversity that existed here, like grapes and citrus and uh, apples and quinces and pomegranates, foods that now we take it for granted, but they came here and blended in with a lot of the native foods being used already. So I saw that as an increase of biodiversity. And in some cases, this biodiversity is unique because some of the fruits are not the best looking fruits. Some of them are ugly. Some of them are deformed. Some of them are small, some of them are too big, but they're delicious, and they're local, and they grow here. Now, the Native Americans continue to grow their crops, corn, squash, beans, cotton, and many of the crops, and this blend basically created this amazing biodiversity, but we're talking about hundreds of years ago. What has been happening now, of this grandiose diversity that we can say that the the, the fruits, the, the crops blending together, the cultures blending together, brought us a lot of variety of things. But the economic, the political arena of this region has changed a lot in the last few hundred years. We have that this place used to be Native American land. Then it became New Spain. Then it became Mexico. Then it became the United States particularly this place right here, the Tucson Basin, has gone through all those changes of culture. So what that did, in my eyes, it decreased the amount of diversity. The new cultures imposed what they brought, in some cases did not correspond to the existing diversity that was here, and that diversity started to decrease, and some of these crops started to be forgotten. Now, what I started doing, is looking at that diversity and go back in time and try to find what these plants were. Where were they? 
Who's growing them? Where do they grow? Are they still here? So this project, we called it the Kino Heritage Fruit Trees Project because it had to do with one of the greater um, innovators that came to this region and brought a lot of this diversity of crops. One of the Jesuits named Eusebio Francisco Kino. He was one of those people who started the mission process right here in this region that we call the Pimeria Alta, the land of the upper Pimas, or the Tohono O'odham. And he brought this diversity of crops, including animals like cattle. And his work basically increased this diversity. But after the political arena, as I mentioned before, those crops started to disappear because the new cultures didn't correspond to the previous culture being here, in this case, the Anglo-Saxon culture and the Spanish culture. So these trees started to go into the background. So what I started doing is trying to go and find them and collect them and bring them back in a horticultural way, collecting cuttings and reproducing them and creating clones and bringing those trees and those fruits and those flavors back. And we've done it in a way. So now we can actually say that we have found some of these crops, bring them back to Tucson, grow them in greenhouses. We've grown them at the Desert Museum. We grow them at the Mission Garden here in Tucson. We grow them in other greenhouses around here. And being able to reproduce those trees and bring them back and be able to taste those flavors just like the Jesuits used to do a few hundred years ago. And it's not just about planting those trees and growing them. It's about the people. It's about the culture. And for me especially, is the flavors. Because what we're bringing back, we're bringing back biodiversity. Why is it important to bring biodiversity to our region? Because biodiversity means resilience. Biodiversity means bringing back a whole array of flavors, a whole array of adaptations that if anything happens in the future, we're going to have that diversity to be able to continue and any pests or any diseases that may come to the fruits, there's going to be enough genetic diversity in those crops to be able to mitigate those problems. Fortunately, creating the Mission Garden just about eight years ago, uh, working with colleagues at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum and working with uh, a very enthusiastic group of Tucsonans, as well as uh, several government organizations, we created a place called the Mission Garden. And it's a, a garden an ethnobotanical garden where we are growing all these varieties of trees. As an individual, you can go and visit, and you can look, taste, touch these fruits. You can taste history. You can taste the past by enjoying the variety of fruits that we're growing. Some of them, most people don't even know what they are. And once you visit, you get connected to those plants and those crops. Now, that deep history that I'm talking about, the connection of Native American agriculture with Mediterranean agriculture that also corresponds to thousands of years of domestication, has created what we now have, Tucson, a creative city of gastronomy by the UNESCO. It's not just the restaurants and the ethnic groups that we have around Tucson with wonderful food that you can find in town. It's about that deep history and the connections to the traditions that connect recipes, connect culture, connect linguistics, connect the people that have been part of this exchange that we have here in Tucson. So think for a moment. What are the connections that you have with the place where you live? Do you know what foods are adapted or traditional to the place where you come from? Do you remember the flavors that your grandmother would be producing out of the kitchen, the smells that came out of the kitchen. What are the tastes of your childhood? What are those flavors that when you taste them or you smell them, reminds you of your infancy, of your childhood, or simply reminds you of your mother, your grandmother? That to me is what made this project fascinating and also an obsession because it's not just eating these delicious foods and growing them, have the pleasure of growing them and producing, but is also making a connection with the people that I love, my ancestors. And one example is that that knowledge that I'm talking about, the knowledge of the past, is with us. It could be right next to you. It could be your grandmother. 
sitting next to you, and we continue to ignore the knowledge that she has. Could be your grandfather. Could be the neighbor. That knowledge is there, and we need to tap it. So these fruits are fascinating. You are only uh, eating something that gives you pleasure, the sweets, the tartness, whatever it is, that fruit that is unique, but you're connecting to history in a very deep way. Thank you. <laughs>